Hey everybody, it's uh, Aaron <coughs> coming off a, a, I think a week or two off of doing the live streams and it seems like I already forgot everything. Uh, <laughs> I will, we should be getting started once this countdown finishes up. Uh, I have a couple little preamble things to go over as usual. Uh, not doing a giveaway today, unfortunately. But then we'll get into something like 30 d different tips that were a part of this, uh, that was a part of this quick tip live sesh, uh, jam sesh, I should say. Um, and then we'll, we'll uh, look forward to doing it again next week. I think we're back on regular schedule, so sh we should be doing this every week. So sit tight. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and actually, let's just turn off the timer and let's just get started, actually. The, the reason why we do the timer was something that, that Lars suggested. It gives people an opportunity to join us and to get in here and to, you know, meet and greet. Uh, I see we got people from all over the world, uh, Croatia, California, Germany, Canada. I'll actually be up in Canada on Friday. I'll be going to Toronto. If anyone wants to play a little uh, shinny with me, I'll be, uh, I'll be down. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, let's go ahead and just get started. Uh, I'll try to skip all this preamble stuff when we actually put the recording up on YouTube. Um, let me know if uh, any of the, the audio is not working or if you have trouble viewing the video. I'm actually working on a new computer, which I mentioned I was having misspelling issues because it's a new keyboard, so I uh, misfire every once in a while. But anyway, this uh, live session is an opportunity for us to to show you some, some of the material that we presented at uh, AU and some of the sessions. Um, I had the opportunity to do four different sessions, two, uh, two generative uh, live hands-on lab sessions, uh, this quick tip session, which we did with a number of different people. And then also um, I did another session on simulation. And the good news for you is that a lot of them are available online. You can actually access recordings and, and view them at, at your leisure. So make sure to take advantage of that. Uh, with that said, let's let's get right into um, the PowerPoint. Actually, it's a little bit PowerPoint heavy today, but that's just going to give me an opportunity to get through a lot of different stuff. So let's just jump right into the deck that we used. Of course, I, I did actually truncate it a bit. This original session was something like um, an hour and a half. I don't intend on going that long today because, you know, you guys all have stuff to do. You got, you got other things to see to. So here we go. So this is a quick little recap uh, highlight session for the, the quick tip jam session that I did with, uh, we had our little queen theme since it's a jam, you know, we're, we're, we got our jam band together. Uh, Bryce, me, Jamie, and Patrick, you can see there, Patrick on the right, uh, he actually put together a lot, of, a lot of tips that I won't be showing, but I'd recommend that you take a look at some of the things that he's created. He's created a lot of like API based solutions for, for things that people are, always looking for so make sure to, to grab that recorded session if you get a chance I don't think they're up just yet but make sure to, to check the web page which I will be linking in the description once this wraps up so tips for all so this these tips are, are based in basically all workspaces for all walks of life it doesn't matter if you only sketch it doesn't matter if you only you know create features or if you only do one thing or another all of these will be applicable in, in all the different workspaces and hopefully they're all very applicable to what you do so uh, the way this is gonna work is I'm gonna run through the slide deck and then I will jump into the software and show you a lot of this stuff uh, live because I think that's a lot more valuable than looking at all the slides but um, so S key, hit the S key on your keyboard. It's going to bring up this menu. I'll show you how to interact with it once I'm actually in the software. Uh, it is good to note that these are specific to the different workspaces. So you know, if you're if you're creating Sketch, you'll see the one like you see in the lower left there. If you're creating uh, Cam Tool Pass, you'll see the one in the lower right, etc. Uh, this is a cool one, uh, and this is. This is something that'll help you avoid having, you know, hundreds of different versions because every time you save, you know, you get a new version. There's actually an opportunity to create a local save. So it's not going to, you know, create a new version every time you do this. If you hit command and shift and S or control shift S, if you're on a PC, it's going to create a, a local save. That's not going to create a new version. Uh, it's going to make it a little bit easier to manage those. There's a shortcut to switch active documents that, that actually <laughs> I just learned when I was running through this sesh with, with some, of these, uh, some of these other presenters. That's, that's the beauty of doing these things, going to AU, it's the networking, it's learning from others and, and all the great stuff that goes along with that. If you hit 
command, obviously in a Mac or control, plus the tilde key, it's going to switch the active document to the next one down. I'll show you that one as well. And this is one that Jamie Shearer put together, and of course he's got a lot of flair, so he, he added some nice little gifs there. But uh, this is one that I've created a quick tip about as well. Um, and this, this is much easier to demonstrate, so I'm going to actually just jump over to Fusion and we'll get right into it. So, um, I'm going to use this. I, I saw this really neat design on Instagram, actually. It's a, it's a park bench. Obviously, it's oriented improperly. I'm going to get to, to why that is and how to fix that in a little bit later tip. But I'll just use this opportunity to show you some of these things I was uh, talking about there, like the S key shortcut. So, you know, say I want to add a fillet or something. And actually, you know, I actually wanted to use, um, eh, we'll, we'll go with it. Let's add a fillet to this. So, you know, obviously you can go and you could find it in the menu, but you know, which menu is it in? I forget. I always, you know, I, I always, without a doubt or without without question, I'll always go to the wrong menu, especially when I'm doing something live. So to avoid all that, uh, what I'd recommend is using that S key shortcut. If you hit the S key, it brings up, as I mentioned, this very modal uh, shortcut list. This is very customizable. Um, it helps you find commands that you might use day in and day out. So if you start typing in things like fillet, uh, you'll see it actually finds, you know, my sketch fillet. Uh, it also finds the model fillet, which I'm actually looking to use. If I wanted to add it to this list to be able to access it easier without typing in, uh, I could hit this button. It's going to pop it up into the menu up here at the top. And now I can very easily access that fillet command right there. So that's, uh, that's a nice little option to take advantage of. Of course, if you hit the S key, you you find that you're not using one of these all the time or you know it's just fallen out of favor with you you can always click and drag to remove it that's going to just pop that off and uh, clear that up for you um as mentioned you know we can get into a lot of different versions this arduino that i was working on here has 11 different versions as you can see here to avoid all those different version creations we're going to use that um, control shift or command shift s to create a new version it's going to be hard to demonstrate uh, the way that i'm doing it right now but if i hit shift command s i want you to watch up here what it says it's going to say something about you know creating a recovery version. Uh, so basically that that saves it so you don't have to worry about losing any uh, data in, in, the, in the event that something crashed or if some problem occurred. So that's that's a nice little switch to or option to be able to take advantage of. Uh, the switch active documents, let's jump to the first one on here, uh, is pretty handy. Just hit command or control tilde. It's the that key, you know, right next to one. Uh, command tilde, it's going to pop through the different uh, options that I have open right now. It'll go all the way to the end. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't go back, and I think that there might be something there, but we we can figure it out. So um, you know, might be something we could uh, improve upon. But Command or Control uh, tilde that key right next to the one or above tab will toggle through those open uh, documents that you have. Um, let's get back to the data panel to show off that thing that we were talking about. And the way that I'm going to do this right now is I'm going to hit. Control Option P, and that's actually another keyboard shortcut. So if you're if you find you're accessing the data panel all the time, Command Option P. This I didn't have a, sh a slide to represent this, but uh, I'll just tell you this now: Command Option or Control Option P will open and close that data panel for you. And so, as I was mentioning, um, the one that Jamie Shearer had with the Back to the Future GIFs on there, and I'm sticking to GIFs. Uh, you can say it. GIF if you'd like, but uh, I'm going to stick true to that. Um, anyway, <laughs> that's an internal debate that we have all the time. I don't know if you gather yeah, pick up on that, but um, what I was what what that was in relation to was that if you if you you know you want to go up a level, uh, a lot of times I'll accidentally hit this guy right, and that took me up more than a level. Took me to my top level of my my projects list right and of my data panel. So. There's a nice little tool you can use to, to get back to where I was before. So maybe I could go up just the single level that I was trying to do. This little tiny button here that says back, it's uh, going to send you back to where you were. Uh, I had created a quick tip for that previously, but uh, it's always a good thing to remind people those things get buried because uh, we're adding so much content day in and day out. So um, back to the slide deck, let's, uh, let's continue on here. Uh, zoom to fit, uh, this one I use all the time. I mean, if you're rotating around, if you're zooming in and out, if you, 
if you might have a part out in space somewhere, you can find that you'll 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 very easily lose track of where your model is. So there's a really nice shortcut to get to this. Just double click that middle mouse button. It'll do a zoom to fit. Again, I'll demonstrate these in a moment once we get into this. Uh, select other. This is this is incredibly handy for for anyone who you know is having trouble selecting something. And I'm I'm going to demonstrate this in the the event of creating a fillet once again. But you know sometimes you want to select a body or you want to select a component or you're having trouble selecting a vertex or edge. Uh, if you left click and hold, it will bring up this little menu that you see in the the images on the right hand there. Uh, it does let you kind of sort through kind of wherever the mouse is. It's gonna it's gonna find different options that you could be trying to select. Now sometimes it won't have what you're actually looking for, and that could just be the case where maybe your mouse cursor is too far away from you know what you're trying to get at. Now this one's very important because it can it can cause some issues if you if you think you're hiding a component but in fact you actually hit a body. This all has to do with the way that you select your items in the graphics area, and this is this is a common problem that we we uh, have to overcome. If you learn about the different selection techniques, it's going to help you to to kind of avoid that. At, um, and if you're not able to avoid that, there is also this display utility. As mentioned, this is one of these things that uh, Patrick Rainsbury, one of the, the band members, uh, created on his own. Uh, it's a pretty fantastic tool that will help you with the additional menu items that you see there. And it's going to enable you to, to do things like show all bodies, which is currently not an option in Fusion 360. It's going to allow you to do like show hidden items. So it's going to find any components or bodies that you've hidden. And then it's going to enable you to bring those back if, in the event that they're like buried, you know, levels deep in your components groups. So uh, let's jump back into this. Let's close my data panel with that command option P, uh, and let's jump into the bike frame. We're going to use this as uh, a demonstration model for this next thing that I want to do. So let's just zoom way out. You know, um, if if you know, you find yourself in your model is tiny like like I've done here. All you need to do, as mentioned, is just double click that mouse wheel. It's going to do zoom to fit, and that's going to enable you to to get that model back in the you know where you can actually see it and begin to work on it again. So, very important to keep in mind. Uh, while I'm while I'm on that subject, it, it's also worthy to note that wherever your mouse cursor is is where the the zoom is going to occur as you spin your mouse wheel in and out. So keep that in mind if you're trying to get to a very particular area. Um, watch where you're pointing that cursor. It's going to help you get to, to where you're going. Um, now, now let's let's create this fillet. And where I want to do it is basically this edge and the edge opposite it. Um, and with the way that this model's been, you know, assembled so far, it's hard to see both those at the same time. But let's see what we can do by using that uh, select other option. So I'll hit F on my keyboard to grab my fillet command, just a keyboard shortcut. Uh, of course, I could have accessed it from that S key shortcut that I uh, created earlier. Um, and I probably should have to demonstrate its value, but uh, I hope everyone saw the value anyway. Um, and let's go in to start to select the two edges that I wanted to get. And with this new fillet tool, um, with combining rule fillets and our traditional fillet, um, it, it wants us to find all sorts of things. It's looking for faces and edges and features. And this is something that, that you might have had some trouble with lately because of these changes. Um, so let's let's just select the first one and as I go to try to find the other one, it's not going to find it through the back of this part and that was something that, that it might have done previously. Um, so instead let's left click and hold and just try to get in the, the, the vicinity of where you think that edge might be with that part in the way and you're presented with this nice little list and so it's finding, you know, whole face it's finding a chain of edges that go around that piece that piece and continuing on until you see there's actually one single edge down here it looks like that's the right guy if you have question on whether it's the right one or not of course you can always rotate around and, and double check and visualize and do some things there to try to, to see it a little bit better but once you have those two selected you can start to drag that out and add that fillet uh, to those two internal faces of this piece here so Nice little option. Uh, select other is, is incredibly helpful. And actually, I use it in, in simulation a lot. So so what I wanted to, or actually I use kind of a little 
internal trick uh, when I'm in simulation and let's let's just jump into the workspace real quick to show you that I know I'm not actually in the works in the simulation portion of this uh, presentation just yet but it's something that that uh, I discovered and I wanted to share with you anyway I'm in this this sim workspace let's do a zoom to fit by double clicking that that mouse wheel twice um, and say I want to add a constraint so I'll hit the C key on my keyboard just another keyboard shortcut for you there um, and say I want to fix like the where the, the axle passes through the back of this uh, swing arm. Um, what you'll notice is that it, it defaults to, to wanting to select things like faces and edges sometimes. And, and you know obviously I want to get the cylindrical face on the inside there. So what I've found is that if you just go and like give a little nudge of what you're looking for, like select a face, uh, it's going to want to then find other faces. So so once you start defining uh, one of these faces for the constraint it's going to enable you to, to find like entities so once I selected that first face it's now kind of filtering through and looking for other faces so that enabled me to select those two guys now all I need to do is just deselect the one on the outside there and, and I've created that constraint between those two pieces like I had wanted to do so it's just another little option for you to, to take advantage of um, I know we're not in simulation yet but um, it's just something to keep in mind there. Anyway, let's move now to this Arduino model that you might have seen me scroll through when I was using my command tilde to go through my active documents. And in this case, you know, it's got a lot of detail and I'm gonna be using it a little bit later in, in the simulation workspace again to, to do some other things. But um, what I wanted to do was just to like hide some pieces here. And, and as I mentioned, the way that you select items can can definitely play into what you're actually selecting right so if I just you know left click once on this pin that we see here and hit the V key on my keyboard to hide it it's gonna hide um, the body so left clicking a face once will get the body selection for you so I'll do it again let's get the next one click and hit V and you know it's hidden that unfortunately and Instead, I actually wanted to hide the entire, you know, circuit that was tied to that, or the component that's that's that that pin's actually attached to. So to find it, sometimes it's very difficult to to find those bodies and turn them back on within the component that it's contained within. So if I click another, I mean, that's going to help me kind of like filter through. It'll actually give me some faint highlighting on you know where that component actually is. But using that display utility, I can actually come in here and say, you know, show all bodies. It should bring back those two pins for me to, to be able to work with. So make sure to jump into the add-ins. Uh, the Fusion App Store will, will enable you to get this display utility. Uh, I use it all the time. It's very handy. Uh, highly recommend it. That said, uh, there's another way that we could have selected it to avoid that so instead we could actually bring our cursor up here double click and when you double click it actually gets the component so in this case you can see it's now highlighted everything that's associated to to, to that body and you know the parent of that body which is that atmel component and you can see it's it's now highlighted in the browser I can then you know hide or show the component itself rather than individual bodies that make up that component I'll double click my mouse wheel to go back to the zoom to fit. I saw a question there from Mark. Um, and uh, I see also a comment that the control and tilde doesn't work for Mr. V. I might have to double check the, the option uh, in the PC version of Fusion 360. I, I apologize if I got that incorrect. Um, so let's go back to the slide deck. Uh, there's a couple more things that I wanted to talk about. And this sketch one, I'm actually not going to be going into the software to talk about because Bryce, our, our first Fusion 360 live stream was all about sketches. And I believe Bryce showed you all of these things. I would recommend you take a look at that first live stream we did. Uh, it's, it's super handy. It's, it covers all kinds of different uh, sketch shortcuts. So. This thing, this includes things like you know how to create tangent arcs very quickly, how to create and continue so you don't have to go back and reaccess your line command all the time, and how to do things like create you know um, perpendicular lines and tangent lines when you you click and hold on items. Uh, it's also going to talk about things like right click to add constraints. This is a very efficient way of adding lots of uh, different constraints. Um, tangent dimension. This was this was added to Fusion. 
uh, what was it like six months or eight months ago? This is super handy to be able to add, you know, more precise dimensions when dealing with with circles and, and things like that and arcs. So this is a great option to take take advantage of. Essentially, it's just accessible from the right mouse menu, as you can see in this uh, nice GIF that we put together there. Uh, the auto projection and auto construction constraint and relationship issue. Uh, when you're sketching on something that has all kinds of faces and edges behind that face, uh, it, it's, as you know, it's going to want to pick those up. And unfortunately, sometimes that's not the behavior you want. Uh, in cases like that, if you hold control or command, uh, it's going to avoid doing that while you're in that sketch. So it's going to enable you to you know, avoid creating unwanted uh, constraints. Um, next. This is, this is another one that I made a quick tip for a while back, but uh, when you're in a sketch, sometimes it's nice to just get rid of all the, the bodies and components that, that are in the way when you're looking at it. In the sketch palette, you'll see there's actually a slice option if you toggle that. It's essentially like doing um, a section view uh, temporarily within that sketch. It enables you to see right on that sketch plane where you're creating that sketch, all the different faces and edges that are associated to that. So. In incredibly helpful. Make sure to take advantage of that. Scott Moyes uh, taught us that, uh, or taught me that, uh, the way that it slices depends on the way that you're looking at the model. So in this case, we're looking at this model from the top, so it slices it from the top. But if you were to rotate it, hit that slice button again, it would slice it from the opposite direction. So just uh, something to keep in mind there. All right, so we're getting into some of the modeling stuff. Um, in this case, uh, we're going to jump back into Fusion. Obviously, that's that's our goal is to show you some of these things. Um, Resetting views this is something that I, I do all the time because I really love using constrained orbit. I think it's just so much easier. Some people hate it. Some people love it. I, I'm one of these people that loves it. Uh, so constrained orbit is going to enable you to rotate your models like they're on the, the on a tabletop essentially or or like a turntable. Uh, but it can get very annoying if the model is oriented improperly. So I'm going to show you how to reset that in just a second. Uh, you can also do this to to just alter the way that the shadows look in the model. So sometimes you just want to take a quick screenshot or rendering. Uh, using this option to, to alter that is going to enable you to, to, to adjust some of the lighting conditions on the model because the base environment has some lighting conditions obviously already uh, associated with it. Uh, lock on joint origin and between two faces, that's something that's best shown in software. So let's just jump right back into this and I'll jump into that, that really cool um, bench assembly that, as I mentioned, I saw on um, Instagram and I modeled up uh, best I could. But um, obviously this is oriented in, in the wrong way, right? Uh, benches should not rotate like this. I mean, obviously I could come in here and change my default orbit type from constrained to free and then I'd have the option to change it any which way. But what I really want to do is is I want to change the default orientation. So what it does is when, you, when you're in constrained orbit is it treats that it rotates about the top plane, essentially. So I just need to reorient my or my view cube. So I'll just kind of rotate around until I get to what I imagine the top to be. I'll select the view cube to jump, you know, completely normal to that. Uh, this is important. You know, you don't want to just willy-nilly set a new view at a, at a weird angle. Uh, so once you're in this, this nice uh, orthogonal view, we can right-click on the home that you see there and set the current view as not home, but uh, as a top view. And once I do that and I start to rotate, you'll see it's going to now enable me to, to rotate this, this bench in the way that I'd expect. And so I'll be able to interact with this in, in much more predictable ways. So that's, uh, that's something that, um, that uh, I find incredibly helpful. Um, as I mentioned, uh, and, and I probably should have noted as I changed that view orientation, is that when I did that, it actually changed the lighting. So I'd, I'd recommend that you open up a model and you do this on your own. Uh, it's going to help you to visualize this a little bit better than, than me doing it. But you know, if I rotate around, you can actually see some lighting happening on the, the bottom leg, leg there. That's just related to the appearance that's applied to the legs. Uh, but but let's try this again. Let's change this from like back to top again. So I'll, I'll right click this, set the current view as top. And you see actually kind of like got a little darker on top there it looked like. So again, I'd recommend that you, you get into to your own assemblies, your own designs and try this for yourself. It's, uh, it's going to be a little bit easier to, to see uh, on your own computer screen probably. Um, okay, so we'll jump back into the bike frame. Uh, let's do some of these, these uh, joints and talk about some of those joint origin issues and things like that. 
Uh, so the first one was that that locking on joint origin. This is this is super helpful when you're working with bolts. Like all the time, you, I use this for for joining bolts into the right location. So this bolt, obviously, sorry for rotating so much. This bolt obviously goes into this little uh, location here. Attach that frame. So what I'm going to do, I can't use an as-built joint, so I'll hit J on my keyboard to bring up my joint command. And as I zoom in here, uh, I want to make sure to get the bottom edge of this bolt. Um, but you know, if I if I click right now, that should work. But but I really like to make sure that I I get the joint origin right where I want it. So what I'll do a lot of times is I'll move my cursor to try to select that face, but but you can see it just by moving my cursor, it's changing what is actually being highlighted there. And, you know, now it wants to put the, the joint origin, you know, somewhere along that cylindrical face. So instead, let's uh, let's just hold control or command as I go over the face. And you'll see now wherever my mouse cursor goes, it's not resetting where those, those joint origins are being created. It's going to make it a little bit easier to then go and select the center of that. So that's just a nice little option here. And coming around here, we'll, we'll find that edge and put it into the right place. And pay attention to what you select first, because what you select first is what's going to move when you're creating these joints, right? So, so that's always important to note. I don't want the frame to move where the bolt is, right? I want the bolt to move to where the frame is. So that's why I select the, the bolt face first. Um, continuing on, now I want this this you know suspension to be centered in this location here and um, doing that is somewhat difficult because I don't really have a, a joint origin between these faces right so this is where this between two faces comes in incredibly handy so let's do that joint again let's just um, let's use my my marking menu to, to get to this. So I'll right click and hold and because I want to repeat the last command, this is what I use this probably the most for. If you right click and hold, it brings up this, this marking menu. If you then scroll through uh, whatever it is you're trying to do here, it's going gonna, it's gonna to get you into that command. So if you right click and hold and go up, it repeats your last command. That's an incredibly helpful tool to use. So in this case, uh, I do want to get the center of this cylindrical face. So again, this is one of these times where I could actually, you know, getting the center face on this is hard so I'll hold command and that'll keep that face active so I can get the center and that's not the troublesome one right the, the troublesome one is actually getting this next joint between these two faces so that's where this you know right click between two faces comes up comes in very very handy so I'll select that now it's looking for two faces to use so I'll select one on one side and one on the other. And the third selection it's looking for is just, you know, what do you want to center this upon? So if I use maybe this internal edge, that's going to pop that uh, suspension into the right location. Uh, it's centered. It looks great. That's exactly what I was after. Um, obviously, I don't want rigid. I want a revolute or something else. So I'll change that. We'll look at the animation and click OK to finish that up. Okay, so I think that's uh, that's it uh, in terms of this section of live stuff. Let's continue on, and, and this is one that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, this is one that I have struggled with definitely in the past. Uh, my appearance management can get uh, a little bit troublesome. This is where uh, remove unuse is going to help you quite a lot, and this this happens. You know, sometimes you just add. Or, or maybe you you open a file. Maybe someone now sends you a file, and there's just like hundreds of different materials and appearances in this list. So if you right click in kind of the dead space there, it'll give you that option to remove the unused ones. Um, that kind of clears it up pretty rapidly. And then also from the right click menu, when you're on an actual appearance, it'll enable you to select objects that they're they've been applied to. So that's that's definitely handy to kind of find and change appearances where they might lie. Uh, replacing materials is is uber simple. Um, if you if you want to just replace like all the appearance all appearances in one component, you, as you can see, you can just click and drag those from your found appearances and put them over other appearances, and that's going to replace those in the model. So um, sometimes you know. You might make all things orange one day, and then you know it's a different model version, and you want to make all things blue. This option is going to help you quite a lot. Uh, 
And then if you're reusing a lot of appearances, and this is something I do a lot because, you know, Fusion has its brand colors and we try to adhere to that as much. And, you know, that orange color that you see everywhere is you know, one of those colors that we like to use. Uh, so I use this my appearances and favorites quite often and, and essentially the difference is that one is on the cloud So your my appearances are just gonna be accessible on the cloud uh, Whereas your favorites is I think specific to the machine uh, in addition to that You'll see that there's there's an ability to override physical material appearances So so like aluminum for in instance, maybe you want it to always be like uh, Anodized blue or something you could come into your properties find the materials option there, and then change the default to be something else. So some, some nice little flexibility there. I forgot to put my little stop sign, so I knew to go back into the software. So let's, let's jump into this. And uh, the Arduino, in this case, is one of these ones that has a lot of materials that, that I have no idea why they've, they're in this menu. So to get to my appearances option, uh, I'm going to use a keyboard shortcut and hit A here. Um, and as you can see, it brings up my in this design option. It's going to bring up a couple of other things here as well. Uh, but and, and this is something that I did on purpose, obviously, just for the sake of this uh, presentation. But there's all these wood materials. There's bamboo, and there's all these uh, other odd things that really don't belong here and, and might not be in use, right? So if those aren't in use, we can right click, and that's where that, act, that delete all unused option is available. So I'll select that. That's going to get rid of a number of those different materials. But there's still one that's you know an outlier here. This this 3D cherry material. This does not belong anywhere in this model. So um, what I can do here is I can right click and I can say select objects applied to. Uh, this is this is this option to be able to you know see where it's been applied and if I zoom in there you can see it's a, it's been applied to one of these components and so that's why it's uh, it's still in this design so at that point I could you know go find a different material uh, metal uh, maybe a steel whatever I'm not gonna spend too much time trying to find a very specific one here but I can just click and drag it um, over the material and that's gonna fix that cherry material and get rid of that make this look a little bit more accurate <laughs> Okay. Um, as I mentioned, if you if you use a lot of the same um, appearances, you definitely want to add them to your favorites and to your your um, my appearances. So in this case, what what we do um, at Autodesk is we just share this file around. And this contains you know all of our default colorations that we want to use, and so. Uh, what you, what I do, if I ever lose them, and, and it, it's happened once or twice, I can, or if I'm like setting up a new account or something, I can go to my appearances here. I can see these in, in this list, and I can right-click any one of these and add it to my my appearances. I can add it to you know my favorites, and now I've added my light gray flat and my blue to the two different uh, options there. So, real easy. If you ever you know lose your default appearances that you like to use all the time. Create a file like this. It's going to enable you to to bring those back and and to to share it with you know others at your office and other people you might work with. So nice little option there. And that's really the only reason why I had this model open. So I'll go ahead and close that at this point. Now we're going to get into some sculpt options and and uh, this was where Jamie came in and this is where Jamie did our last live session where he showed you how to work with generative uh, T-splines bodies so pretty fantastic stuff that he did there. I'm going to cover this pretty quickly um, and in fact I will I will be doing a little bit of this but um, um, most of it's going to be kind of slide based but hopefully everyone knows this by now that as if you click and drag on um, edges like you can see here if you hold alternate as you click and drag it's going to add new faces so um, when it adds new faces when you use that alt drag option it's going to continue the curvature but obviously there's 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 a lot of power to being able to use creases within t-spline so if you want to, to add a new face with a crease uh, alt and command drag enables you to add that with a crease and though the real way to tell the difference there is that if you click and drag on then the face after that or the the edge color you can see it's a lot darker the crease edges uh, have a darker edge coloration it helps you you know understand where some of those different uh, creases might be um, and this is something that that all the all the guys that I know that are like hardcore sculpt users and uh, like really strong with it they always e are changing the way that they look at 
the display. So um, I'll show you how to, to use the, the boxed mode because I think it helps them to visualize, you know, where high curvature changes might occur. And it helps you to, to just see the model a little bit better as you're creating those sculpt bodies. This is, this is a handy one as well. Um, if you click and drag on the scale, uh, the handle, as you can see there, and set it to zero, it basically flattens uh, in that orientation that you're scaling to. So if you, if you notice, uh, you click and drag that, it's going to enable you to scale to zero. I'll try to demonstrate that uh, with, with, um, in the software. And then the shift select is super handy. Uh, enables you to select between a certain number of faces. So if you select one, if you if you shift select the next one right next to it, it gets the whole loop. Um, whereas if you if you select uh, the first and the second, it's going to get just between those two faces. So some nice selection methods to take advantage of. And I keep going the wrong way there. Anyway, um, to demonstrate this, I'm going to use this crane hook. And what I want to do here, and I'm actually going to use this for some some mesh demonstration as well. I did a, a mesh to solid uh, live stream not too long ago, but I forgot one of the methods that I used and, and I want to demonstrate it today. It's a, it's a pretty powerful tool, but essentially my end goal is to convert this into a solid um, or par parametric model. So that's that's the end goal if you want to know the, the details behind it. But here I have created a body. Um, right now it's just, you know, it's just a really simple cylinder and I'm in I'm in, you know, my history free mode, so you can see I can turn my design history on or off. Because I have my design history off in this case, I can just quickly change to my scope mode from the, the workspace change. Um, now, to add those additional faces or to, to do the alt drag as I was showing in the, the, the slide deck, uh, what I need to do is I, I need to get into my edit form dialog, and this one's used all the time, so this is another place where I use my my marking menu quite a lot is and I'll right click and when I'm sculpting edit form is probably the most commonly used one so I'll right click and hold and that's going to enable me to get into that edit form dialog very quickly um, now to get the whole loop of the edge to then do the alt drag you, hopefully everyone already knows this you can double click the, the bottom edge there it gets the full loop so that's another little shortcut that's not the shift selection that I was talking about before that's just double clicking on an edge now I can use my alt drag to, to then pull uh, and add an additional face. So to be able to kind of follow the curvature of this, I need to alt drag to, to get additional pieces there. And then it's just a matter of like rotating and trying to follow the curvature of this guy. So, um, and, and a lot of times it's, it's really handy to be able to just use like the, the center handle there when you use this alt drag, because it enables you to, to really get a lot of flexibility as to what you're doing. So. Essentially what I'm trying to do here is I'm just trying to kind of follow the curvature there uh, a bit. Uh, of course, I do need to show the Alt Command drag. So so the, all those cases I was using Alt drag. Now, if I hold Alt Command or Control and click again, in that case, I created a crease. And, and creases are different, obviously, because when I go and I drag it, I can create like sharp edges, right? Like this is the difference between you know curvature continuous sculpt faces and these creases. So it gives you a lot of additional flexibility related to this. Now that shift select is is pretty handy. Um, as you as you notice, if I if I hold shift as I double as I select this next edge or double click on the next next face, I should say it, it gets the full loop. That's not actually uh, something you can do. It's not like you can just double click a, a, a loop edge. Uh, you have to actually use shift as you do this. But in addition to that, if you if you want to get like just a certain number of faces, like maybe I want to get between like, you know, these ones, I can I can hold shift as I as I select the two outer edges and then double click on. Sorry. Um, double click in the middle one there and it's going to enable me to just get that range of faces. So there's all kinds of selection options and selection uh, tools that you can take advantage of here. So make sure to dig in here. Uh, just just look at the different lists here. There's there's all kinds of options. Uh, as mentioned before, the display mode is, is something that I've seen a lot of very, very advanced sculpting folks use. As you can see, it's accessible from the control uh, one, two and three options. So Control one uh, is going to take you to the the full box mode, which enables me to very easily, you know, parse uh, how the curvature is changing on this model. Uh, there's also the the kind of combined mode, which enables you to see both entities and make changes to both. So I can actually grab the vertices of the box and drag it out, and it's going to change the the curvature 
uh, of that the the, fa the connected faces there. And then also, uh, I, as you know, the smooth display is kind of the, the finished product. That's what I'd get into to, to really get in and um, check this thing out. So the reason why I was creating this, let's jump back into my slides real quick. Uh, the last couple of slides um, are going to be related to simulation and then finally mesh, but uh, simulation is going to be just all uh, slide related. Um, sometimes I'll use the simulation simplify workspace to remove details from overly complicated models. Um, you can use the, you know, the remove features options or the replace with primitives options to do things like turn a very complex circuit board like this into something that looks like this in just literally like minutes. When you do that, uh, if you want to bring it back into an assembly to, to, you know, if you're working on a large assembly, you don't want all that detail on, on just one single circuit board. You can then go and export the model from the Simplify workspace uh, and then bring it back in. It's going to enable you to, to, to then work on, um, work with this uh, circuit board in a very large assembly without causing all that, that resource drain. Uh, cloud solving is obviously huge. Uh, not really a tip here, but I mean, uh, it's, it's a major benefit that we like to talk about uh, by using cloud solving. You remove those hardware limitations, you know. Fusion 360 doesn't require uh, an overly complex system. Um, it enables you to, to simultaneously solve, you know, tens and hundreds of simulations at once. And there's no more of that burden of the local solve. You don't have to sit there and watch things calculate. So it's going to enable you to get through that quicker. Uh, rendering is another thing that I'm going to be using s slides to, to present. Um, dielectrics is something that was added in, I believe it was last year, perhaps even like a year and a half ago, but this will enable you to create some pretty fantastic renderings. What it does is if you have, you know, tr multiple transparent uh, materials, like in this case we have our, our um, whiskey or whatever that is, um, the liquid, we'll call it. We have the, the ice and bubbles and, and we have the glass. And so you want to you want to really control how the light is, is refracting off these things. And this dielectric priority control is going to enable you to do this. Uh, you right click and access these dielectric priority controls. If you want to learn more about this, I'm going to link a blog that is just so amazingly detailed, something, something on the Fusion 360 blog that helped me understand what this was because the first time I heard about it, I, I didn't really get it. Uh, but but you can see there's kind of a uh, there's a very profound difference between the image on the the larger image and the inset image and that's just you know making one simple change to the dielectrics so something to to, to be aware of um, the always render view and this is something that that if you've created a lot of nice renderings but you're continuing to to edit the model and make changes to it if you click and drag those renderings into the left pane over in the rendering workspace it's going to enable you to then uh, always render those when you create a new version. So if you hit save, it's going to, it's going to in the background, go and re-render those to update the views to, to enable you to access tons of uh, up-to-date renderings and, and without having to go and, you know, re-access this and re-render things. So super helpful. And to create really fantastic renderings, make sure to get into the, the lights and the missing materials. This is going to enable you to create images like you see here. Uh, I can't take credit for this one again. Uh, this is Jamie Shearer and I, you know, this is another one of these things where we'd like to enlist him to create another one of these live streams for you guys to, to learn all about that. Now, finally, uh, run a little bit short on time. I, I did actually plan to show you some of that other stuff, but the last one I want to show you was this mesh. Um, and this was related to, a, I was working with someone who, who was creating uh, prosthetics and they were taking scans and then creating, you know, T-splines and doing whatever they could to, to try to convert these into solids. And what they were having trouble with in the end was thickening, because uh, if you look at the curvature map control, there's all kinds of curvature change ha changes happening here. So when when that's the case, thickening's typically not going to work because you might have you know faces that overlap when it tries to, to add material like that. So what we did instead was we used uh, this this T-splines pull to to pull uh, a T-spline over the face of the prosthetic that they were making. So jumping back into Fusion 360. Let's just really quickly hide body three. That's that's one that we we're you saw me working on live there. But uh, previously I'd created this one, and, and really not much more work went into it. I just alt dragged a couple more times, rotated a couple more times, and uh, we're we're about 95% of the way there. All I really really need to do now to 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 wrap this sculpt uh, body onto the the mesh that you see here is come into modify, 
And again, this is where that S key search could come in handy, but I want to show you where this one is. This is called pull. So when you select pull, it's going to enable you to, to select individual vertices, or if you want, you can just very quickly do a box selection to get all of them. And it's going to pull all of those sculpt vertices onto the next closest body. And that doesn't matter if it's a mesh or if it's a sur surface or a solid, it's going to, it's going to do this. So when I created that, that sculpt body that you saw there, you know, I just wanted to make sure to kind of get close to where it was because because you can't have issues if you know if you're super far away and it doesn't know which way to pull to if you have like multiple components so this is something to keep in mind uh, it creates a very fantastic looking curvature continuous uh, sculpt body that I can then use to thicken or I can close off the ends and just you know make a solid hook from this but um, that is all we had for today um, I hope that was valuable. If you like this, make sure to like it, um, give it a thumbs up, uh, make sure to, to, to subscribe to our channel. We, we love hearing from you. I'm trying to use the community tab to interact and find out what you guys want to learn about next. Um, you know, I wanted to put this together to, to enable you to see some of the material that was presented at AU and some of the sessions. You know, there's all the breakout sessions. I also linked to, to some of the keynote addresses that happened. So make sure to take a look at that um, to, to kind of see the direction that we're heading in and the ways that our, our customers are using our tools to, to, to advance their design. So thanks again. Uh, have a great week. Have a great Thanksgiving. Um, I know Canadian Thanksgiving was about a month and a half ago, but uh, or I guess just a month and a couple days ago. Um, have a great one. Cheers.